All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, I saw that we had a lot of uh, hits on the video about the check ride. So I thought I'd um, kind of gather my thoughts a little better uh, and put together a presentation of what I saw in my check ride, at least on the oral portion for now. Um, a little better than a stream of consciousness, if you will. So I'm gonna run through what I uh, saw in my check ride and hopefully this is helpful to you. Um, before I get started, please like and subscribe. I am definitely trying to grow this channel and the more subscribers I get, uh, the better it is for the channel and I can go and make more videos. So let me get started. Uh, so on the check ride for the oral portion, uh, the first uh, few minutes of it were um, kind of going over paperwork. And so what I would suggest is that you put together a binder. Um, what I did is I put a, um, I just got a cheap binder, kind of printed out some things and put it in a binder. So the first thing I had was my logbook data in a nice format so that the DPE could go through and uh, look up in ForeFlight uh, based on my printout. Um, so what he could do is look at my uh, let's say night requirements that I had done those at this date and these many hours and it was broken into a few different flights for for different requirements but it was listed right there so he could go into four flight and find each one of those records and kind of verify that I met the requirements uh, I also printed out uh, or made a copy of my identification make it easier obviously you want your actual ID there but um, just for good measure put that in Copy your medical certificate, which uh, you need with you anyway. So that is in my binder. I take my binder with me on every flight. Uh, my temporary airman certificate uh, print out as well. And then my IACRA application was in there. So we can go through all this paperwork uh, and kind of just make sure legally I had everything I needed. I also uh, printed out my personal minimums. So I figured that was something that might come up later in the check ride, what my minimums are. So I went ahead and, and printed one. You can get that on the, uh, the AOPA website. Um, and then my test results. So I went through the test results, uh, went through anything I missed. Uh, and I actually you know, have a spreadsheet of that. I didn't print that one out, but I had that ready just in case um, there was a question about that. Um, so. You know, my binder, I broke it into different sections just to make it easier. Um, so section one was, again, my airman certificate, my temporary airman certificate, my medical, um, my um, test results, things like that. Um, section two, I had a bunch of printouts of airport information. Uh, knowing that we would have to go over my cross country at some point, I wanted to have all of that information handy so I'm not fumbling through four flight looking for the airport. Um, so I printed out uh, the different airports that we would be going to on the cross country as well as some alternates just in case uh, there was a quick, hey, what's your alternate? What are the runway lengths? Things like that. So I had that all printed out and ready to go. Um, Section three in my binder, I had POH printouts. So knowing that we would be talking again about cross country weight and balance, I wanted to have that information printed out. So I had uh, the weight and balance information from the POH printed out. I also printed out uh, performance information. So when it came to what uh, altitude we're going to be cruising at, what's the RPM, what's the fuel, uh, I had all that handy. I wasn't going to be fumbling around. Um, just uh, being prepared, I think, is a huge deal here. Make sure you're not um, guessing, you're not looking around, fumbling through paperwork, not really knowing what you're talking about. Uh, it helps to have it all printed there. Definitely help my nerves. It's a nervous enough time anyway. Um, so section four of my uh, binder here, and I, I had all of this tab, so it was easy to find, was my... Uh, cross-country information. So I actually printed out my nav log, um, had a paper copy. Uh, can't stress that enough. Um, you never know what's going to happen up there in the air. It could be, you know, surprise, your GPS doesn't work. Surprise, your iPad's dead. Now what do you do? Um, and then it's going back to old-fashioned pilotage, dead reckoning. Um, so uh, once we kind of went through some of that paperwork, uh, the first uh, section was kind of questions about, well, what do you need in the airplane? What do you need on you when you're flying? 
Um, so that's where we went through the, the documents. You know, for me, it was photo ID, my medical certificate, um, my pilot's certificate slash pilot's license once you get it. Um, so that's uh, the first part that we went through. Um, then I was asked, what kind of uh, airplane documents do you need? So there are acronyms galore in aviation. Um, and one of them here is the AERO acronym. So your airworthiness certificate, your registration, radio license, that uh, has to do with whether or not you're going out of the U.S. Um, the O is for operator's handbook, the POH, and W for weight and balance. So um, what I would suggest is get a piece of paper and a pencil and write these acronyms down over and over. Uh, that's what I did. I had a whiteboard that I would write them on, erase them, write them again, uh, just so that I could you know, have these roll off the tongue as the time came. Um, next, we talked about aircraft inspections. Um, what inspections were required for the aircraft? Who's allowed to do them? Uh, another acronym, again, to learn um, is the AVIATE acronym. So that's your annual, uh, that's 12 calendar months. Um, make sure that you are using calendar months and not just saying a year. Um, the VOR, calendar days, the 100-hour check, um, some of these are have to do with whether or not the aircraft is for hire. Um, the altimeter, the transponder, and the ELT, which is uh, good for 12 calendar months or until half of the battery has been used or it's been used for one hour continuously um, or one hour cumulative, I should say. Um, so just kind of know some of that um, uh, and use the acronyms. Definitely write those down and practice them so you have those handy. Um, next, we went into the aircraft MEL or minimum equipment list. What do you need to fly VFR during the day? Um, so another acronym, uh, you know, a lot of people say the A tomato flames that kind of uh, goes between day and night. But the, uh, the A tomato here with the altimeter, tachometer, oil pressure, compass, airspeed, temperature, oil temperature, and the ELT. Um, so that's during the day. Um, there will probably be some questions about, you know, uh, what happens if uh, a piece isn't working? What do you do? Um, and if it's not part of the MEL, that's when you talk about well, you put a sticker on it, you notify maintenance uh, that this is in-op, that kind of thing. So you want to definitely notify somebody and label it so that uh, you don't forget that it's in-op and that other people that might use the plane know that it's in-op as well. Uh, then we go into the night VFR. Um, what are the minimum pieces for night VM VFR? And uh, things like the landing gear indicator, the uh, seat belts, emergency, um, you know, the fuses, uh, the more that you can read about your personal uh, airplane and know, the better. Um, but you definitely want to think about uh, lights and um, do you have all the equipment you need to make this flight? Um, there will be might be questions about, well, if the landing light doesn't work during the day? Is it safe to fly? Would you fly? That kind of thing. Um, and me personally, it's like you, we don't need a landing light in the middle of the day. So yes, it's safe to fly. And yes, I would fly in that situation. So uh, probably will be questions to kind of check to make sure um, that you are being a safe pilot. Um, one thing I'll, I will mention, I think for most DPEs, what I've heard is they're aviators. They love this stuff and they're having a conversation with another future pilot. Uh, they're not looking to get you. They are definitely uh, going to grill you, but really it's a conversation to make sure you know what you're talking about. And if they're up there flying and you're up there flying, you're not going to be putting them in an unsafe situation or yourself. Um, so then there was a question, you know, what is ADSB? Just the gist of it, um, it's a, a piece of equipment that allows other aircraft and, uh, you know, air traffic control to identify you, see your position, your altitude, heading, velocity, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that, you know, what's the difference between ADSB and an out? Um, and the out just is 
kind of telling everybody who you are, where you are, and the in allows you to see other things, uh, other traffic on your system. So uh, just be prepared to talk about that a little bit. Um, then we talked about aircraft repair. Uh, the question was, you know, is there anything you can fix on the airplane? Um, things like, you know, I think, yes, you know, go check the oil, add oil. Um, there's a whole list of things that you can do. There's, you know, 30, 30 plus maintenance items that as a private pilot, you're allowed to do. So I would definitely look that up. Um, not something you need to memorize, but I think it's beneficial to say, yes, you know, there's 30, 30 something of them. I can't name them all off offhand, but name a couple of them uh, that you could do as like your tires and your oil and things like that. Um, then we went over the maintenance records. Um, so he asked me to show him uh, the maintenance records. So we had talked about the AV8s and here are all the required things. And then he said, okay, well, show me, show me that they're valid. Um, pull up the maintenance record, show me the 100 hour inspection, show me the annual, you know, things like that. So just be familiar with them. Uh, you don't have to spend a, too much time in there, I don't think, but just kind of know how to look at it and say, yes, here's the date, here's what it was, here's where the signature is, it was done, you know, check, this is all done correctly. Um, question came up about, uh, can you move an aircraft? Uh, so the thing's out of inspection, and, you know, can it be moved? How do you do that? Uh, and the answer to that was, you know, you can get a ferry permit. A lot of this is like, um, when you think of cars and car registration, if I were to buy a car up in another state and I need to move it, you know, I can contact the DMV and they'll give me a temporary registration that is good for moving that car from one location to another. Same kind of thing with aircraft. You can get a ferry permit that this thing needs to go from this location to the other and uh, it needs to have the inspection done there. Um, the question also was, um, you know, if it's over the 100 hours and you get the inspection, you know, what does that reset the clock? How does that work? Um, so be prepared to answer that kind of, of question about, you know, the time frame for inspections. And if you go over, how does that affect the next 100 hours? Um, the question was uh, also posed, like if you have a ferry permit, how many people can go with you? Um, and the answer to that is the required people. So if it's a, a airplane that requires one pilot, then one pilot can go. If it requires two, then two can go. Um, was asked whether or not, you know, repair is, is being done. Um, yeah, I have a ferry permit. Can I take the mechanic up to kind of listen to the engine, see how it's doing? And no, um, that's not a required thing. So uh, the answer there is no. Um, so after going through all that, we kind of talked about uh, safety and how do I know I'm ready to fly that day? Uh, so again, an acronym, the I am safe checklist kind of ran through illness and medication, stress and alcohol. Um, you know, how, how long do you have to wait after drinking alcohol? And that's the eight hour rule. Um, you know, are you fatigued? Are you emotional? Or have you eaten today? That kind of stuff. So uh, kind of ran through how I personally uh, make sure I'm ready to fly that day. Um, we talked about currency versus proficiency. Uh, and the question was, you know, what's the difference? Um, currency is, you know, legally I have done the steps that I need to do to maintain my uh, license. And proficiency, obviously, is am I any good at it? Um, it's one thing to go out every few months and, you know, knocked out a few landings, so I'm current. Um, it's quite another thing to uh, be good at those landings. Um, so that's, uh, you know, be prepared to talk about the difference between that. And then what uh, the actual rules are, like when do you need to go and take a flight review? Um, what do you need to do to keep your, your uh, kind of proficiency in your currency. And that's, you know, every 90 days go out and do a few landings during the day and then a few landings to a full stop at night. Um, then the question was asked, okay, so you're flying to a ball game with some friends. Uh, they want to pay for the whole trip. You know, how does that work? 
um, and we just need to be able to explain the whole pro rate of things. So if you and one other friend are flying, um, how do you split it, the 50-50 split? If it's four people, how can you split that? What if they want to pay for, you know, hotel rooms and you pay for gas and all this kind of stuff? So just uh, be familiar with that and whether or not you're allowed to uh, be compensated in different ways. And um, the advice I would give is err on the side of caution. It's always better to uh, make a mistake that maybe cost you a little bit more, but you're not going to run the risk of violating any rules. Um, the question was asked about uh, a different plane. So there's, you know, the plane that I'm going to rent is suddenly unavailable, but they have a different one. It has different avionics. Can you fly it? Um, this was, uh, I, I think, a question that was designed to uh, kind of get out of me whether I'm legally allowed to fly it versus whether I should fly it. It's it's kind of decision making and and a legal question at once. So, um, airplane single engine land. That's what your license is for. So, if the other airplane is a single engine land, then the answer is yes. You're allowed to fly it. Uh, should you fly it is the question. Uh, should you get into an airplane with completely different avionics that you're not familiar with and start a long flight? Uh, so the answer to me, no. Um, I'd rather get some uh, training on that system, the avionics, the airplane, before I just jump in and take off somewhere. Um, then we started going over uh, some questions about, um, you know, lift, what creates lift, um, what contributes to a stall, how do you recover from them. Um, so this was, you know, talking about the um, the airfoil, the angle of attack, the critical angle of attack, which was, you know, hammered into me. Um, definitely remember the word critical, critical. Um, so how does a, a stall happen? Um, how do you get out of it? What creates lift? That's the Bernoulli principle, Newton's law, things like that. Um, then we started talking about the engine. Um, you know, what are the magnetos? Why are there two of them? Um, so that, you know, it's redundancy, redundancy, safety, safety, safety is, is what I would always, um, kind of fall back on. Any questions about, uh, systems or why this or that, um, my answer is always safety. Um, you know, I wouldn't take out an airplane that I'm not familiar with because of safety. I wouldn't fly in adverse conditions because of safety. Um, and I think that's what we're really looking for is safe pilots. So, um, so the magnetos, you know, what they are, why do we have two? And it's a redundant system so that if, if one of them were to fail, the engine's not going to cut out. Um, you know, you know, what would be the consequence of a failed magneto? Um, you know, what, explain the four stroke engine, the, uh, you know, the intake, the compression, the spark, uh, expansion, exhaust, you know, the, uh, exhaust, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I had to explain the four stroke engine and what step it was when the spark actually happened. Um, then kind of talked about, well, what happens if your oil temperature increases all of a sudden? Um, what if it decreases? What if you know, what do you do if you see these things happening during a flight? Um, again, safety, safety, safety. Uh, so my answer to most of this stuff, uh, and it's also questions I got during my um, kind of my stage check. What happens if you look over and your friend looks like they're going to throw up? What if they're green? What if they're having trouble breathing? What do you do? Um, and kind of the answer to that is get on the ground, uh, find the nearest airport, get on the ground. Uh, I'm not going to troubleshoot um, oil pressure. I don't know what's going on. Get on the ground, be safe. Your friend's sick. I'm not a doctor. I don't know what's wrong with them. I'm not going to diagnose them while we're flying. Get on the ground. Um, so that's, you know, again, safety is the answer. Um, question about, you know, how a spin happens and how do you get out of it? Um, so we talked about, you know, the, you're losing lift, uh, you know, basically stalling the airplane, stalling the wings and, uh, how do you get out of it? And it's kill the power, 
and full rudder in the opposite direction of the spin. So we kind of talked a little bit about that. Um, went over weather briefing. Uh, the question was asked, where do you get your weather briefing? Um, you know, is it WX brief? Is it for flight? Uh, so be prepared to kind of talk about that. Not what I said is, you know, step one, what, if I'm going out to fly, being honest, I look out the window. Is it storming? Uh, is it raining? Is it cloudy? Um, step two is I look at my phone app, just, you know, weather bug, kind of see what's coming up in the next few hours. Um, because it's very simple to look out the window and say, there's no way I'm flying. I don't need to necessarily go to a WX brief or make a phone call or look at four flight if I can see it storming out. So I kind of walk through the steps I would get to, um, to kind of decide, do I even think it's possible to fly before I get into four flight and look at all the actual conditions. Um, there's a question about crosswind, um, you know, calculating a crosswind component. And that was just on my manual E6B. So I pulled that out and went over that um, and kind of talked about why it's important to look at that. Um, you know, what's the cross, what does it matter? The crosswind, um, what's, you know, depending on the airport you're going to, you know, does today's wind equal crosswind or are we landing, taking off directly into the wind, that kind of thing. Um, talked about the METAR data and just being able to decode this. So uh, I don't know that you need to be a complete expert in this. Uh, it's definitely something that you need to know how to get some of the relevant information out. Uh, in my case, um, I started to decode this, but then pulled up for flight because it, it kind of decodes it all for you. But knowing the, the basics of this and what each section is telling you um, is definitely needed. Uh, luckily, there are decoders out there to make it all easily uh, readable, but um, definitely something you need to know how to do the basic decoding of. Um, then we started talking about the cross-country plan. Um, going over my flight plan, what headings we're going to use, where did I get those headings, how did I get those headings, what, uh, how did I calculate the wind correction angle, um, what airspace we're going to go through, over, around, um, you know, talk about the difference between restricted airspace, uh, MOA airspace, um, and how you deal with that. Um, then uh, kind of talked about the kind of cruise speed, uh, how much fuel we're going to be using, um, what RPM, all that kind of thing. And that's where, again, the printout from the POH comes in very handy. You just uh, you know, I had that already printed out. I could just open that and say, here's where I got the fuel requirements. This is the the uh, the RPM that, you know, I'm planning on using and, and calculated all my fuel based on that. Um, and then alternate airports, again, I had the printouts. So here's our alternate if we need it. Here's the runway, plenty of room, all that kind of stuff. And then talked about how much fuel we're going to have on board, how much do we need for the flight, um, how much do we need um, if we get there, we, you know, we need 30 more minutes of, of fuel, all that kind of stuff. So um, kind of talked about a, a couple of other things and kind of a, as he was asking me questions, one of the uh, things was, well, where do you find that information? Um, so things like the POH, uh, the uh, PHAK, the Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, um, the FAR AIM. Uh, it's, it's some questions you won't know the answer to, but um, this is an open book to some extent, uh, but you need to know what book to open. So uh, that's definitely, uh, you know, bring these things with you, at least have access to them. Um, as I've mentioned in the other video, like Google is not an option. Uh, you can't just search for it and tell them, oh, it's in this thing. You actually have to be able to pull up the book and say, it's right here on this page in this section. So um, things like A Tomato Flames, if you can rattle off 91205, um, that, that not only shows that you have uh, kind of studied this material, but it also makes it easier for you to jump to that section, 91205, and go through that list. Um, 
would suggest that you tab your far aim. Uh, I did that with a little uh, piece of paper or a little sticky note kind of thing so that when the question was asked, I could go, oh, it's right here in this section, open the book to it. Um, you're not expected to memorize the far aim, but I uh, should definitely know how to flip to a page really quickly and get what you need. So hopefully this helps. Again, I have another video. It's a stream of consciousness. Um, you know, if you want to check that out and please, again, like and subscribe to these videos. Uh, I want to go out and film some more and do some uh, training, IFR training in a stimulator and uh, definitely looking to make more videos for everybody. So hope you enjoy it.